Hello, hello, Dan Jane Goodall. I am honored to meet you today. My name is Genevieve Bourne. I am in Montreal, Canada, and I'll be hosting this event today. Thank you for taking time to meet with our young citizens of the world. So I will introduce you to them. Over 60 years ago, Jane Goodall first uh, set foot on the shores of what is today Tanzania's Groom Bay National Park to begin her pioneering study of chimpanzee behavior. For six decades, her research has transformed scientific perceptions about the relationship between humans and animals. And now her mission has evolved and grown into a quest to inspire, empower, and motivate others to make the world a better place. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and United Nations Messenger of Peace, Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you for being with us today. Well, hello, and thank you for inviting me to join you. Our first question for you today, Dr. Goodall, comes from Cloverdale Catholic School in Surrey, British Columbia. My name is Ava, and I am a member of the student leadership team. What led you to pursue studying chimpanzees in the wild? And how did your initial experiences shape your understanding of these animals? Well, first of all, I was born loving animals. And when I was growing up, television hadn't been invented. So I spent time outside looking at the squirrels and the birds and the insects and reading books. And I love reading books about animals. And I was 10 years old when I read the book, Tarzan of the Apes. And that started my dream. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. But Everybody laughed at me. How would I do that? We didn't have money in my family. World War II was raging. Um, Africa was a dangerous place. We knew nothing about it, really. And I was just a girl. But I had a wonderful mother who said, if you really want to do this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And then if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. So left school no money for university, got a job as a secretary, then got invited to stay with a friend in Kenya, saved up my money. And there I heard about Dr. Louis Leakey, famous paleontologist. And it was he who asked me if I was prepared to go and study chimpanzees, the animal most like us. And it didn't change what I thought about chimps because we didn't know anything about chimps. Nobody had studied them in the wild. So it was all learning, learning, learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going uh, towards the center of Canada in London, Ontario for another question. Hello, Dr. Goodall. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Vero Lopez and I'm joined by one of my students who is in grade two. Her name is Chidi, and she is a huge animal lover and definitely a future leader. Um, so I will turn it over to her for the question. Hi, I'm Chidi. Over the years, what are some of the most surprising or profound discoveries you've made about chimpanzee behavior, communication, or social structures? Well, <clears throat> you know, what was the most surprising? Basically, everything was surprising and wonderful because it was all new. But I suppose perhaps most exciting, so much of their behavior was like ours. Like they kiss on greeting, they embrace, they hold hands, they beg for food with their palm out, uh, outstretched. They, uh, you know, <laughs> go away. It's just the same as we do. And two males competing for dominance stand up and swagger at each other and shake the fist and their hair bristles. And that reminds me of some human male politicians. So, And then I love watching mothers and infants. The young child has a long childhood, just like you do. And the next baby isn't born till the oldest child is about five years old. Why is it a long childhood? Because they have a lot to learn. It's not all instinct. They learn by watching, imitating, and practicing. And so, I, I, you know, perhaps one of the things that was really exciting at the beginning, 
is that they use and make tools. At the time, we thought only humans used and made tools. And then a shocking discovery was like us. They can be brutal. They can kill. They have a kind of war, primitive war. But they can also be loving and kind and altruistic. So all of that together, you can see how like humans they are. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to West Alice Central High School in Vernon Hills, Illinois. Uh, hi, my name is Tony. As you heard, I'm a student in the 11th grade at West Alice Central. And um, my question for you is, given the state of uh, environmental degrada um, degradation and loss of biodiversity, what do you see as the most urgent challenges facing the conservation efforts today? Well, you know, the situation is so bleak that we need really to tackle everything together. And try and imagine it like this, the whole of the human race, it's as though we're at the mouth of a very, very long, dark tunnel. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star. And that star is hope. So there we are at the mouth of the tunnel, and it's no good sitting and crossing our arms and hoping the star will come to us. We have to roll up our sleeves and crawl under, climb over, work around all the obstacles between us and the star. And it's climate change. It's loss of biodiversity. It's the killing of the soil with industrial poisons, pesticides, and herbicides. It's the increasing shortage of water. It's the cruelty, the cruelty to animals in intensive farming. And intensive farming is not only cruel, huge areas of land are wasted to grow food for animals, more food grown for animals than for starving people. And to change vegetable to animal protein, you waste an awful lot of water. And added to that, the animals produce methane gas, which is a very, very bad greenhouse gas, worse than carbon dioxide. Luckily, there's less of it. So there's all these and more. We've got to alleviate poverty. We've got to try and reduce unsustainable lifestyles where people have so much more than they actually need. And so all of these things together, and luckily there's enough people who care. There are people tackling each one of the problems and we need to get together these different groups and work out how we can attain that star as soon as possible. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Thank you for your words. Definitely made sense. Mm. I just don't know what to yeah, say. And I, I, mean, I, I, I hope you, that but... you I hope that you can gather a group and join our Roots and Shoots program and decide yourselves which of those projects you want to tackle. Some will tackle one, others will tackle a different one. Together you'll tackle them all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goodall. Now we are coming back to Canada. We have a question coming from Saskatoon in Saskatchewan. Good morning, Dr. Goodall. Very honored to be with you today. I uh, recently read a book by yourself, uh, The Book of Hope, very inspiring conversation with you and, and Douglas Abrams. I hope everyone has a chance to check that one out. Very inspiring. Um, my student is actually sick today, but was so committed to uh, asking you a question, wouldn't miss it for the world. So she's logged in from home. We have Sydney uh, from her host in Saskatoon. Hi, Dr. Goodall, my name is Sydney. Um, and my question is, how can individuals, communities, and governments work together to foster a more sustainable relationship with the natural world and protect biodiversity for future generations? Well, it's a little bit like I was talking about the tunnel. You know, we all need, we need to listen to each other. We need to try and work together. And because, you know, We've got a window of time when we can start healing the harm that we have inflicted on Mother Earth. But it is a window of time that isn't huge. It's closing. 
So the urgent thing is to get, you know, citizens and interest groups and governments all working together. And it's only when we all work together that we have a hope of solving the problems in time. And luckily, more people are beginning to understand, yes, climate change is real. There's a gigantic hurricane called Milton that's that's bearing down with huge waves and terrible winds on my friends in Florida. And, you know, there's around the world, there's terrible fires, there's heat waves, and the weather patterns are completely crazy. So when people say, oh, well, climate change, yeah, the climate is changing, but it's nothing to do with humans. It's just a natural cycle. Well, even if it's a natural cycle, which, of course, I don't believe, but even if it is, we still need to get together to try and do something about it, right? And it takes all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, I would like you to maybe have a final word, a final word for our young citizens of the world who are listening to you today. How can they engage? How can they help? And how can they convince the adults as well to do the work that needs to be done to protect our natural world? Well, I would encourage young people to get involved with the Roots and Shoots program of the Jane Goodall Institute, because then you'll be with like-minded young people from all around the world. We're in 71 countries now, with members from kindergarten all the way through university and even some adults. So being involved with like a family around the world is quite inspiring, so the young people tell me. And so... In our Roots and Shoots program, you get to choose three projects to make the world better. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment that we all share. And a lot of people feel, you know, the world's in a mess. I'm just one person and there's nothing I can do to make a difference. You alone couldn't make a difference. But when you think there's people all around the world young people and older people and old people like me, because <laughs> um, I'm 90. So when you think about all these different people all doing something to make the world better, that makes a huge difference. So the message that I have for young people is remember every single day you live on this planet, you make some kind of difference. And depending on who you are, how old you are, what position you have, then you can make a different kind of difference. But we all make some difference. And when you put those different those uh, people together, even if a million people do one small thing like picking up litter every day, that's going to make a big difference worldwide. So that's the last word. Remember, every day you live, you make a difference, and you can choose what sort of difference you make. So it's lovely meeting you all. And thank you all of those I know are listening. And thank you for inviting me to share some words with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you for your kind words, your wisdom and your drive, you know, to encourage us to protect the natural world and, um, you know, make the best we can to protect this world that sustains us all. And I think our young citizens of the world everywhere were inspired today by your words and are ready to take example and create a brighter future for the next uh, generations to come. Thank you very much, Dame Jane Goodall. Well, thank, you. thank you too. And in that book that was mentioned, the book of hope, my reasons for hope are set out. The work of young people is number one. Number two, nature is very resilient. Give her a chance. She'll come back and make beautiful places we've destroyed. And animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And with this amazing intellect we have, we're beginning to find ways of living in greater harmony with Mother Earth. So thank you and goodbye. 
Thank you. And thank you to all our young citizens of the world listening and watching today. Thank you. Thank you. Merci.